Hey everybody, welcome back to part two of my three-part Essen 2014 preview show. Uh, let's continue. We are on page two of the Big Geek List, which again, the links to the Geek List is in the show notes if you would like to go and follow along. Um, if my scrolling skills are not up to the task, here we are. Grog Island. Okay, um, let's see here. Oh, uh, da, 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 da. oh yes, 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 yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Whoa! Calm down. So, this is on the list. One, because it's coming um, from, uh, you know, Eger Spiele, Pegasus Spiele. They have a very good track record for choosing very, very good games. Uh, strong Euros. But this is another one of those designer pedigree games. Because it's from uh, designer uh, Michael Renick, who was the designer of Pillars of the Earth and Cuba and many, many other really, really top-notch games. So he's been around a long time. He has been making games that people love, that people rave about, that people still play you know, religiously years after they come out. So he knows what he's doing. His name on a game should be a big deal. And quite frankly, I don't think he draws as much attention as he should. You know, um, like the Felds or the Cathalas or the Rosenbergs out there. Um, he's a really, really top-notch designer, and this is his latest design. Also, I'm really, really intrigued by this game because it's at its heart an auction game. It uses dice as your bidding mechanisms, I believe. I, haven't, I have to admit, I haven't read the rules here for this. I am so confident this is going to be good, just based on the pedigree of the publisher and the designer. And the fact that Jen and I, we are always looking for a cool, non-traditional auction game that changes things up. Because, you know, auction games for two players, they can be tough to find. And usually, uh, whenever we find one that works well, we really fall in love with it. Like, Pelevenes is one of my top ten games of all time because it has a non-standard auction. Grog Island has a non-standard auction, all about pirates trying to get the most grog after, you know, they've had all their... Uh, you know, they're, after they've finished with all their looting and plundering, they come back and they're just trying to have a great time. I guess that's another reason I really like it, because normally pirate games are all about, you know, sailing the seven seas and trying to sink each other, which is unfortunate because we love pirates, but we don't want to destroy each other. This is a game where, hey, we're just uh, hanging around, having a good time back at port. Very, very excited about Grog Island. Ah, the ancient world. Okay, from designer Ryan, I want to say Ducat. Although, I'm probably just thinking of Deep Space Nine, uh, everybody's favorite Cardassian. Let's see, is it Ryan Lucat or, or, or Laucat? Ryan Laucat. I'm not sure if I got that right, Ryan. Um, he previously did a game called uh, Iron City, I believe was the name of it. Is that right? Uh, oh, oh, I'm looking. All right, let's just look it up. I think it was Iron City. Or City of Iron. Is that it? Yeah, City of Iron, which is a very, very neat game. It was a deck builder that really introduced some very, very cool, interesting twists to the core functionality of deck builder. I respected the heck out of it, thought it was a brilliant design, just didn't... Um, it. It unfortunately required too much conflict. It was really designed so that, okay, players will get in each other's face. And so, no, we didn't keep it. Um, plus, I think it would be better with more. But anyway, this is his follow-up. Um, oh, by the way, he's also the artist on these games, and he's an incredibly talented artist. And this is a this is a civilization building game where you know you're spending a good deal of time, you know, try, you know, playing cards, trying to make a better civilization than your opponents. But you can kind of see in the picture here in the background there are these titans that wander the earth. And while we're doing all our normal stuff of worker placement, using our workers to build up our civilizations and try to be the most prosperous, we are also building up an army. Not to destroy each other, but to defend ourselves from the titans of this world. Uh, actually, everything about this game, if you look at the box cover, so reminds me of uh, Shadow of the Colossus, which was an amazing, amazing um, PlayStation video game from... God, how long ago was that? Must have been, must be coming up on ten years ago now. That was an incredible work of art. This looks like just, you know, strictly speaking, an incredible work of art because Ryan is an amazing artist. He's his his art is so evocative and pulls you in in such a huge way. And then, you know, love civilization building, love civilization building where the threat is external, um, you know, driven by the game instead of other players. So very very excited about the ancient world. Plus, again, it was a, his last design was brilliant, so I hope this one will be too. Orcs, orcs, orcs. All right, this is on Kickstarter right now, and I backed it. I don't know if, if that means I should actually put this on the list, because I've effectively already bought it. But um, 
I have a tag. I'm gonna, I've already put it on here. I'll, I'll leave it here anyway. Because certainly the main thing is I will not have it. Oh, but there's no... I guess the thing. There's no reason for voters to vote on it. Uh, this probably shouldn't have been on the list. Because again, remember, this whole list is all about giving my Rotto Runs Through voters the chance to vote for what games they want me to pick up at, e th at, at E3, at Essen. And they, I, I've, I'm already getting this. So... I shouldn't have put this on the list, but what the heck? Since here, I'll talk about it. It is another tower defense game. Although interestingly, unlike every other tower defense game out there, tower all these tower defense games are pretty much being made cooperatively. Everybody works together to defend the tower. This is a competitive one. That's really interesting. The notion that, yeah, I mean, you can see, and it, it obviously borrows a lot of inspiration from um, Castle Panic. Although, not just Castle Panic. Uh, uh, Carnival Zombie did it this way. There was another tower defense game starring DC Heroes, the DC tower defense game or whatever it was. The notion of, okay, you have you know a series of, of concentric circles that represent all the different fields that bad guys will slowly move towards your castle that you're trying to defend. Castle Panic may have been the first game that really um, you know, popularized that notion, but I don't think they own it. And I think this is definitely a different enough game. One, it's competitive instead of cooperative. Two, it's a deck builder. You are building a deck. You can see there's all the cards you're trying to buy to build to your deck as you're frantically trying to fight. And it, I mean, obviously, I think it looks good because I've already bought it. I've already backed it on Kickstarter, and I cannot wait for it to show up. So I should, I've spent too much time talking about it already. Um, orcs, orcs, orcs. I guess orcs, orcs, orcs will get replaced on the actual voting list by lap dance, which I mentioned in the first video. Alrighty. Which I was a coward and didn't include, and then I included it the last second. Anyway, though, evolution. Here's another regret I have. Actually, the uh, publishers of this, North Star Games, they actually contacted me six months ago and said, hey, we'd love to send you a review copy of Evolution. And I already knew about the game because I had actually proofread the original Russian release, and this was a re- uh, you know, a reprint with a with a with a bunch of updates that Northstar put out, and I knew I liked the idea. You know, the whole notion that everybody has their own you know prehistoric race of creatures, whether they're you know mammals or lizards or you know bugs or whatever they are, and every round you have a hand of cards that represent different evolutionary traits that you can apply um, to deal with whatever the problems are that you're facing. Whether you, you let them evolve tails that you know can uh, snap off so they can escape from predators, or whether they evolve into carnivores or herbivores, you know, and all this stuff. Love the idea. It's so great. But I was always put off, and this was true for the original Russian as well, by the fact that the carnivores can eat the herbivores. I, if I beg the right type of animal, could eat your animal that you've been lovingly crafting. And of course, you can give them evolutionary advantages to protect themselves from mine. And so I, I said no. And I was an idiot because... Honestly, you know, and they said at the time, you know, Rich, it's really not that bad that, you know, the the aggression, the conflict wasn't that big a deal. And I still said no. And now here I am six months later kicking myself for not having taken a copy of it because I'm thinking seriously about picking it up at Essen because it just looks great. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I, the art turned out to be beautiful, gorgeous. You can see from this image. I know the gameplay is going to be good. And I really should have trusted them that the conflict is not that big deal because I've read that over and over and over again that the game do doesn't really have to be a heavy in your face take that kind of game. And so I'm full of regret. Um, J'ai regret over evolution. Looking forward to it at the show. Tragedy Looper. This was, I think, my number two most wanted game. Number two or number three most wanted game at Gen Con this year when I flew halfway around the world to try and get a copy of it. And they sold out. And so I did not get a copy and came home empty-handed. Hopefully at Essen that will not repeat itself. I will be able to get a copy of this thing because this game so pushes um, Jen's buttons specifically. She is a huge fan of time travel. She is a huge fan of TV shows like Quantum Leap or... Um, Nowhere Man, or uh, Burn Notice, or what's the one we're watching? Oh, uh, a person of interest. Shows that are about some person in some extraordinary circumstance who every week, in addition to solving whatever their big problem is, they also have to save people. Some new random bunch of people are going to be killed or going to have their... The mortgage foreclosed on their farm or whatever, and this poor schlub who has his own big, big problems, he's on the run from the law, or um, you know, there's a government conspiracy, or you know, he's possessed by whatever, um, or he's lost in time. Um, in spite of that, they still take time to help poor people uh, who, who need, who, you know, who are down on their luck. And that's what this game is. We are time travels. We go back in time where there is going to be a murder, I think. I think it's always murder, or there's going to be some terrible tragedy that happens, and we have to try and stop it.
or I should say, um, one player in a two-player game, one player is the person trying to stop it. The other player is the forces of fate that's trying to make it happen. And so this is so Quantum Leap, the board game, where you are effectively Sam Beckett trying your best to, you know, to stop, to change, um, to make right what once went wrong. And I know Jen is going to love that. Plus, this also introduces Groundhog Day stuff. Because since you're a time traveler, you go back, you start trying to solve the problem. You don't even know what the problem is going to be yet. Um, you know, because there's no Iggy talking into your ear through Sam. I'm telling you what's going to happen. Can you tell we're fans of Quantum Leap? Anyway, was it Iggy or Ziggy? Ah, anyway, um, that crazy little... Anyway, um, so if it doesn't work out and the bad thing happens, rewind. You do a loop and you get to go back and try a second time. The forces of good, they get three chances to avert the disaster. It's brilliant. It's been around forever in Japan. It's uh, hugely, um, you know, um, not influential because there's nothing else like it, but, uh, you know, very respected design. The people who were lucky enough to get it at um, Gen Con this year, I hate them all because I flew halfway around the world to get one and I didn't, but ugh, voters, don't let me down. I want to be leaving Essen with a copy of Tragedy Looper. So, anyway, moving on to Dice Brewing. This one, you know, this one might not have made it so high on the list if it wasn't for the fact that I recently did a run through for Aaliyah E Octa S and I was reminded just how much Jen and I love a good midweight Euro or I'm not, a midweight Euro style dice rolling game that's just about rolling the dice. That doesn't have to be about, you know, going into really heavy stuff like Twa where okay, you roll or or even me not that it's heavy, Castles of Burgundy, where we roll the dice to pursue something else. Um, a game where you just roll the dice and you're trying to use them to capture and claim stuff on the board. Um, that's what this game is all about in the you know, service of brewing beer, which we don't really care about one way or the other. But I've read the rules. It looks really, really solid. It looks like it could be a wonderful companion piece because Jay and I love just the idea of rolling dice. And we love Push Your Luck. And I talked about a few of those in the, uh, in the first video, Dragon Run and what was the other one? Um... Oh, but anyway, um, would love to have another mid-weight Euro-style one. And Dice Brewing looks like it's going to fit the part perfectly. It looks gorgeous, brilliant production, lots of dice rolling, lots of colorful dice, lots of tough decisions to make. Very excited about Dice Brewing. Okay, ooh, Uruk 2, uh, the Entfeglum Gate Weiter. All right, hope I got that right. Uh, poor Miss Yantis, my high school German teacher. Wherever she is, she probably a shudder as, as I just mangled that statement. Here's why this is on the list. And here's why it's on the list very, very high, even though I know almost nothing about this game. This is a sequel to Uruk, which has been around since like 2007 or 2008. I've always been curious to try Uruk because I've read nothing but good, good things about it. It's a very good, solid civilization building game. And now, here is a sequel that's coming out that updates the graphics. You know, the, the, the original one was kind of low rent. It was, you know, a very, very small budget game. And just, you know, one of those hidden gems that nobody, that only a few people know about and people who know it love it. And I just never got around to getting it. Here comes the sequel. Big, big revamp um, to, you know, a, a, a much higher quality production, nicer redone art. It, you know, it is, it's, it's a sequel slash revamp of the original. Um, adding new rules to kind of maybe streamline and straighten out whatever problems are with the original. But here's why I've always been interested in this game. And that's why it's on the list so high. Because we're getting into the high folks, now, uh, into the high stuff now, folks. Um, in the description for Uruk, I see. In fact, uh, I'm not going to dig out. It makes it very, very clear that yes, this is a you know an ancient civilization building game, and you know they all but bold and underline and all capitalize with no warfare, no conflict. That's tailor made for us. That's what we were always looking for. We love civilization building games, except they always um, feature strongly feature players trying to destroy what others create. This is a game that completely eschews that, so we can just focus on making the best thing civilization the world's ever seen. So love that. Why isn't there more of that? So excited about Uruk for that reason. Okay, Baker Speed. Actually, this these two these are tied. Really, they're both here because of Baker Speed. Uh, Paititi or Paiti, Paititi. I don't know how to pronounce that. All I know is there's a, it's a card game in the world of ancient Incas. Players in Paititi are archaeologists who unearth, art, unearth artifacts and assemble them for exhibitions. Sounds nice. Fine. You don't want to tell me anything more. You don't want to give me rules. Whatever. Baker Speed, though, I am very excited about because it is a real-time Sherlock Holmes inspired, you know, Baker Street, Baker Speed, get it? Real-time um, dice rolling crime solving game. I don't know who we are. I don't know if we're actually Holmes or if we're, you know, what is it, the the... 
The Baker Street Boys? Hey, what's the name of street urchins who help homes? She can't hear me. What's the name of the street urchins who help homes? Or Sherlock Holmes? Oh, the something army. Ah, Jen can't remember either. Jen's actually read every single Sherlock Holmes story in the world. She got the Sherlock Holmes omnibus, read the whole thing cover to cover. Apparently, she absorbed it too much. Can't remember. Uh, but anyway, I don't know if you played those kids or your Sherlock Holmes themselves, but the important thing is you're rolling dice as fast as you can to solve crimes. That's enough right there. Love real-time games. Love dice rolling games. Love Sherlock Holmes. Baker Street is a must-have. And here's the reason these two are together. These are both coming from... Oh, I forget the name of it. There is a... Um, oh, where is it? In Austria? Uh, see if it'll be in the yeah, uh, oh you're not putting it there maybe you put it in the description of the other one um, anyway every year there, there's a game museum in Europe and I can't remember where it is and every year they put out games oh uh, yeah the uh, the Ostreicher Spiel Museum they put out games for an incredibly cheap price super super low price and they make these games strictly to fund and support the museum and keep it running I think that's awesome. And every year, they put out a really cool game. Last year's game was um, Handler de, Car de Carreau, which ultimately got um, republished because it was so good. Baker Speed looks amazing. If I'm going to go over there and I'm going to buy Baker Speed for whatever it's going to cost, 10 euros, something like that, I might as well buy Petiti 2 because they're both going to a good cause. And um, you know, and again, in the past, the, you know, the people who put these little charity games together to run this museum have made good good choices so that's why i'm excited but especially excited about baker street ah uh, dragon scroll oh you know what this one shouldn't be on the list either should it because i've already ordered this yep this will have to come off the list too because i already own or i don't own but i have bought it i could not wait i had to have it and the reason is dragon scroll is the latest game from the fragger brothers who um, are famous for only producing, or I should say overproducing, one game a year. They, they lavish their one game they put out every year with incredible over-the-top um, components. They're just gorgeous. You can see you know, that we play a bunch of dragons in this game. Um, and let's see, there's, no, there's not very many pictures, but there is a link to the instruction manual. So I'm going to open the instruction manual now so I can show you a little bit more of what the game looks like. And it would have been smart if I would have done this ahead of time, but it's downloading pretty quick. Okay. In fact, there it is. Let's go ahead and open it. And right. So, I mean, you got these really awesome dragons. You got these awesome village pieces, but you also have this flaming tower of death. And the dragons, and it's a tile laying game where you're laying down tiles to create the, you know, the fantasy countryside that your dragons will then travel around, as you can see, trying to um, b blow stuff up, I believe, with their fiery breath. And so all that stuff sounds very, very cool. It looks like there's a lot of stuff. I haven't actually read this yet. I, I bought it. Well, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, you can see, you know, they, they set stuff on fire. Oh, yeah, they're fighting orcs and stuff because there's or orcs running around that they have to, they have to defeat. But when they burn fire, uh, they have these uh, discs that they throw into the Flaming Tower of Death, as you can see from this picture here. That's the only picture of it. It looks really cool, though. And the Flaming Tower of Death, as you can see, splits them, so you don't know exactly which direction the fire is going to go. It could go all over the place. And that sounds very cool. Very reminiscent of the Cube Tower of Amerigo. Except now, it's a disc tower, and that's awesome. And the pieces, I know, are going to be awesome. We still have Spellbound, which is just an absolutely gorgeous game that plays really well. So these guys have a record of producing nice-looking games, or you know, insanely gorgeous games that play well. And they also have a record of their games selling out super fast, and then you can't get them anymore. And so that's why I had to buy it sight unseen. So sorry, I shouldn't be talking too much about it, even though I just spent all that time talking about it. Um, it's not going to be on the voting list because I've already ordered Dragon Roll. All right, moving on, though to Keyflower the Merchants. All right, I, I think there's, this is first of several expansions to games we really love. Love Keyflower. Another expansion for it that adds a bunch of new stuff, including, as you can see from this picture, actually building buildings onto all our tiles and upgrading the tiles we already have. That's cool. Keyflower is in my top 10 games of all time. So yeah, of course this is a big deal. And then Snowdonia. Um, actually, last year I picked up a couple of, th these are like little uh, deck of cards expansions that really kind of, well, they don't change the core, but they add new flavor to the game, which Snowdonia is also one of Jen's of my favorites. We absolutely love it. It's an excellent worker placement game about building um, rail lines over mountains. 
And every, you know, we've played most of, I think there were three we have now, and we've played two of the three. I still have to play the last one. And now they're putting out another one, the Necropolis Railway. So I feel like i got to get that so that when I have that, I've got the complete set and I can do a big run-through that goes through all of the expansions for Snowdonia because Snow Snowdonia itself is the bomb. Okay, and here's another expansion. We're in the expansion section, Seven Wonders Battle. Um, very, very cool. Seven Wonders is another one of my games in my top 10 of all time. So, of course, this is very, very interesting to me. This adds two new modules, although the central conceit about this is that it adds laws to the game that, you know, create game-changing effects that affect everybody as long as the law stays enacted. And players have the opportunity to change the laws of the land, and suddenly that can change everything. Now, that's a mechanism that works brilliantly over here in Lancaster. Absolutely love it there. And um, so I imagine I'm going to love it even more in one of my favorite games of all time. So I'm very, very stoked about Seven Wonders Battle. All right, more expansions. Um, Theseus, Dark Orbit Bots. Uh, I did a run-through for that last year. That Theseus was maybe our biggest surprise or one of our biggest surprise hits of the game because I thought we were going to hate it because... Or not me. I knew I was going to like it, but I thought Jen would hate it because it's kind of a, you know, a space horror film, you know, kind of like in the style of Aliens, there's a creepy abandoned space station called Theseus. It's in a dark orbit. And um, players take on factions. One player could be the space marines. One player could be the scary aliens. One player could be the uh, scientists trying to, you know, do research and find out what happened to the ancients. One player could be the ancients who've returned. There's all this stuff. And it's a Moncala game where everybody is fighting each other on this Moncala. But it was very abstract, and it turns out, as long as Jen doesn't have to play any uh, character Characters who use guns, she loves it. And so, hey, look, there's a new faction we can get that I believe the bots don't use guns. So Jen's very excited about that one too. So that's cool. <clears throat> Thirsty, just a second. Ah, next up, claustrophobia, Fuhrer uh, Sanguinis. Uh, I probably got that wrong too. But um, claustrophobia is by far our favorite dungeon crawl of all time destroys descent annihilates mice and mystics it is so good i've done a run through for it so you can see that its first expansion was so good and honestly i had given up hope i thought it was never going to get another expansion and yet here comes another expansion yay with and this is interesting. It doesn't really matter for me and Jen. It introduces a three-player variant. So now three factions, three players can be playing at once, which is awesome. But now and there's a lot of misunderstanding um, because it's officially reported as being a three-player only expansion on BoardGameGeek, but that is wrong. It is a two or three. So for people who love Claustrophobia, which has always been a two-player game, and you thought, oh, crap, I can't get this expansion because it requires three players. It doesn't. BoardGameGeek is wrong. I've tried to point this out, but it has yet to be fixed. But anyway, so this is a high, high priority one for me and Jen because we love the base game so much and are always looking for more con more claustrophobia content to devour. And another expansion. This was another huge surprise hit where, again, a uh, publisher just tried to push something on me that I was sure we wouldn't like. Um, Tash Kalar was one of our favorite games of last year. An excellent, abstract, chess-like game. This is basically Wizard's Chess as a kind of an abstract... You know, I'm not even going to go into the theme very much other than to say the theme is brilliantly integrated. I talked about that at length in my run-through, but anybody who says it's a dry, boring abstract is wrong, wrong, wrong. This game is full of life and passion and excitement. It is a Euro version of an arena combat game from designer Vlada Shavadl, who is one of the best designers working today. He's made some of our favorite games of all time, and Tosh Kalar is amazing. And it was so disappointing when, um, you know, apparently... I don't know much of the specifics, but apparently... Uh, CGE, the original uh, Czech publisher, was not happy with their partner, Z-Man, because Z-Man, when they published the English version, they made the price way too high, and so the game was not as successful as it should have been, because a lot of people were put off by the high, high price. And so, this is such a happy story, because CGE has gotten the rights to publish their game back, and now they are going to continue to support it um, by publishing English versions, and this is the first, hopefully, of many expansions. It's a whole new faction, the Frost, the Everfrost expansion, and so it's just awesome. It's probably not going to cost very much. It's uh, made with love for an amazing game, and I'm so excited, and it's just a happy story of the game could have floundered and never you know, had a chance to find its audience, but hopefully now it will, now that CG is taken back. And I just hope that that same story will repeat itself someday with Legends of Andor, and somebody else will pick it up since Fantasy Flight is letting it flounder. 
My number one game that I would put on this list, spoiler alert, would have been um, and or Legends of Andor Lands of the North or something of Norden, whatever it is in German. But unfortunately, it's only being published in German by Cosmos. It would appear it is never going to be published in English, even though it is the... Oh, 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 it drives me so nuts. But anyway, sorry. So as nuts, as furious as Fantasy Flights makes me by just continuing to ignore and or their best game in their catalog... Um, CGE was able to get the rights to their game back and they're going to treat it right. I wish Cosmos would do the same. But Cosmos, for whatever reason, they never seem to care about publishing anything in English anyway. But oh, I can just pray to the lords of Andor that, they're, that something will change and we'll finally get all that great Andor content that just keeps coming out in German only. All right, anyway, sorry, that was as an aside because it's not on my list because I can't put the German only game on my list because I'm not going to get it because my German is nicht so gut. All right, anyway, ah, and um, here's another happy story. Uh, this is a little uh, pack of cards expansion, yet another one for Agricola. We bought every single one up to this point. Probably, probably I'll end up buying this regardless, but eh, maybe not. I mean, we've got plenty of them. But anyway, the reason I'm so happy that this thing is here is because, hey, it proves that Caverna is not going to overshadow Agricola. Because if you followed my best of 2013 videos, you know that um, Jen and I, we're huge Agricola fanboys. You know, down with Caverna, up with Agricola. And I was really worried that Caverna means Agricola was not going to get any support in the future. And yet here we are, a year later, is there a Caverna expansion on the list? No, Caverna didn't get any love. Agricola continues to get it. So yay! Sorry, don't get me wrong. Caverna is a great game, too. It does a lot of really neat stuff, but Agricola is so much better, and that's why I'm so happy. I was so happy to see that a new deck of uh, occupations and improvements was coming out. Yay, Agricola! Jen would like to say... I'm a fan girl. Oh, uh, yes. Very important distinction. Um, I knew that. I did know that, yes. All righty. Uh, number four, three. Uh, another little deck of cards expansion for City Council. Did a run through City Council quite a while ago. Um, great game. Very, very neat. Another city building game. As I mentioned now several times, Jen, I love SimCity inspired city building games, but the thing that made City Council unique was it was a semi-cooperative game where while everybody's working kind of cooperatively to build the best city they can because you know the city could fail the city could basically go into bankruptcy if we didn't build if we did not work together well to build a good city but at the same time we all had our own secret goals because um, you know people would come to us and ask favors and so we had our own goals that we were trying to achieve while ensuring we still built a good city brilliant game Jen and I liked it a lot and now here's what's cool about this disaster deck it adds I guess a bunch of disasters that we'll have to deal with that you know could harm our city and it turns City Council from a semi-co-op game into a 100% fully cooperative game. Because now the disasters are such a big deal, we don't have time to work at cross-purposes anymore. And I think that makes City Council the first SimCity-inspired fully cooperative game on the market. And that is awesome sauce. That is why I'm so excited uh, to find out more. I hope it makes it there. I'm not actually sure if it's going to be there or not. There's no images. There's nothing for it yet. So it might not make it. But fingers crossed it will. Alrighty, onward and upward to Heroes. Now, um, this is, as it says, the first non-historical game created by Historical Games Factory, uh, you know, publisher in Poland that up till now has predominantly focused on, you know, historical simulations of, you know, I, actually I did a recent run through of a game of theirs called Outcast Heroes. Great group of guys, you know, very, very passionate. And this is them branching out away from historical subject matter into pure high fantasy. And um, this is a game, this is very much a, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, a dueling wizards game, which is like my least favorite theme in the world. I am so burnt out after playing years of Magic the Gathering. Every time another dueling wizards game come out, pass. I just can't find myself interested at all. I feel like I've done it all. You know, um, you know I tried uh, Summoner Wars. And I've tried a few of them. And it's just like, we just don't care. We cannot bring ourselves to enjoy Dueling Wizards. The most boring... Over People complain about there being too many wizard or zombie games. Forget about that. There are too many Dueling Wizard games out there. And now, to completely contradict everything I just said, I am super stoked about Heroes, which is a dueling wizard game where we are trying to, we have cards that represent different units we can summon. We're trying to summon them and to fight the opponents. Here's everything we hate. Here's why I'm so excited about this. It's a real-time dice-driven game. We are rolling dice as fast as possible to get the mana that we need to summon our creatures so that we can have our creatures fight the other creature, and that sounds so awesome! 
Oh my gosh, I'm so excited for Heroes. Oh boy, I, 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 you know, um, that real time um, competitive stuff. I mean, we, Jen and I, we enjoy real time so much. So, um, Galaxy Truckers and um, what did we just do the other day? Oh, uh, Zombie 15 Escape, um, Jab, and Heroes looks like it's going to be the latest. We just love real time games. We used to love playing um, video games together all the time. And so, real time board games are just wonderful because they scratch that kind of video game tactile um, pressure itch that we love so much. So, that's why I'm so stoked about Heroes. But now I should move on from Heroes to Johari. The reason this is on the board, on the more than anything else, is because this is another designer pedigree. I talked about some of those early on. And. This one is from the designer of Oddville, which I've yet to do a run through for, which is so weird because Oddville is an incredibly good game. Love, love, love Oddville. Really should do a run through for that sometime. But um, in the meantime, this is basically that. I can't remember the designer's name. Let me look it up because credit where credit is due, right? Let's look his name up. Dee, 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 dee. Uh, Carlo uh, Levisi. And you know what? I believe this was for sale at Gen Con, and I totally meant to get a copy then, and I just missed the boat somehow. But anyway, it's in the voters' hands. Hopefully, they will make the right decision, because I really think this is a game that's worth picking up. And for whatever reason, look out. They are, you know, I've, I've contacted in the past, but, you know, they're, they're not interested in giving me a review copy, so it has to be bought. And that means it's in the hands of the voters whether I'm going to be picking up a copy of Jahari. But fingers crossed, because Carlo Levisi is an incredible up-and-coming designer. Oddville was amazing, and this game looks fantastic. Actually, it's interesting, um, Tom Vassell just ripped it apart in, uh, in a run-through the other day, saying it was incredibly boring and dry and lifeless and dull. Reminds me very much of his uh, Vasco da Gama thing, which, in fact, Vasco da Gama is an amazing game, and I suspect Jahari is as well. So, I don't know, we'll see. Voters, choose wisely. Oh, and then another one, um, Dungeon Bazaar. Oh, now this one should be way, way further up the list, because, again, this is another example of the publisher just couldn't be bothered to tell us anything about this game. We're just left in the dark. And yet, it's come up incredibly high. Um, whatever... 66 minus 46 is, you know, at number 20, I guess, I think. I'm super stoked about this for one reason. Well, there are two reasons. I love the theme. We are running, we are merchants working in a bazaar, trying to sell our goods in this fantasy universe, selling our swords and our armor and our healing potions and stuff like that, selling them to the heroes who are game controlled. They're running around. They're trying to get the best prices they can for the equipment they need because they're going to go off and have an adventure. And um, honestly, I love playing the other side. Instead of going off and having the adventure, being the merchant who makes a living off of them is just very, very cool and exciting to me. So I love the theme. But what's even better, this is from the design team of Zolkin, the Mayan calendar. This is their big follow-up. That right there. Zolkin is an amazing, amazing game. This has an amazing theme. It's from an amazing design group. Super stoked for Dungeon Bazaar. Oh, why isn't there more info? Why doesn't this even say from the award-winning team that brought you Zulkin? Why? What is wrong with game publishers? Don't they know how to sell stuff? It's crazy. Um, I should say I complain about this because, of course, I've been trained in this for my years in the video game industry. And, it, and marketing is so important. And publishers, board game publishers, just whatever. Patchwork. Okay, moving on. Uh, one of two Uwe, or Uwe Rosenberg games that are on my list. This one is funny. I just did a run-through for a game called Quilt Show a few weeks ago, which was a lovely gateway game about making um, quilts. Um, and while we liked it a lot, that was very neat. It was a little bit too gateway-ish, a little bit too light. If we had, if, you know, if Jen's parents or my parents lived here, we would have kept it. This looks like the same topic, but the other side of the coin, a much heavier your Uwe Rosenberg two-player only game about building quilts and as you can see in this game uh it's all about there's like this crazy collection of tetris shaped pieces that you're trying to lay down together you can see this quilt is half finished there's still a lot of empty spaces on it that haven't been filled up trying to make the best quilt you can by drafting for all these different quilt pieces very very similar where but whereas that was a fairly light gateway game i'm hoping well, this one probably is going to be a gateway game too i don't really know but I'm hoping it just has a little bit more oomph, a little bit more meat, um, because the subject matter is great, and Jen would absolutely love to have it. We have um, a huge patchwork quilt hanging on our wall in our bedroom that you know helps minimize sound bouncing and all that. And um, but Jen just loves it because it was made for her by her mother-in-law, and so uh, yeah, quilts have a have a place in our hearts. So anyway, I'm um, still. So, uh, boy, 
I when I made this list, I really made a lot of mistakes. This game is already coming. This will not be on the voters list. Sorry, it shouldn't have been. But I, I included it here anyway because this is another incredibly happy story. I backed Masilla must be t- coming up on two years ago on a crowdfunding source, a French one, uh, Ule or something like that. Although it was it was on several, you know, people backed it on Indiegogo, back to where I backed it. And because it looked brilliant, it has gorgeous, um, wonderful, cartoony art. The rules sounded really, really good. It just looked like a really rock solid euro. I backed it, and then the uh, the publisher slash designer fell off the face of the earth. Um, stopped communicating with people, and I think to this day it's still not a hundred percent certain what happened. But all I do know, I am one hundred percent certain, is. He was not a um, you know uh, dine and dash guy. He was not a con artist. He ran into some hugely big personal problems in his life. I remember reading at some point that somebody thought his wife got cancer or um, something. But all I know is this game financially ruined him. You know, sent him into bankruptcy. Uh, you know, it has consumed him with so much guilt. Uh, that he's been carrying around ever since, that he failed to deliver on this, and he took all those people's money, and it all disappeared because of a series of unfortunate accidents and mistimings with printers and all that. And so he's been carrying this weight around for years. Nothing he can do. He'd never be able to get himself out of debt to be able to actually produce this game. And then Pearl Games came along and extended a hand, because they just liked the game, and said, hey, you know what? Send the rights over to us. We will publish this game, and we will make sure that everybody who backed this game two years ago will get their copy. Even though it's a big financial loss for us, we will do that. And, oh, my God, that is amazing. And, um, you know, they actually published a uh, letter from the, the original designer, and he was very gracious, I guess, and, you know, and so thankful that, you know, this huge weight that's been, you know, weighing him down and just destroying his life for so long when it should just be a fun happy lovely game that he just wanted to make people happy it's just was this incredibly sad story and then on top of that yeah there are a lot of people who are outraged and furious they didn't get their game but who cares about that i care more about the the human component that his life was ruined and pearl games stepped in and saved the day so that's really incredible so i just put this here everybody pick up a copy of masala anybody watching this video Support Pearl, because they did such an amazing thing. And I'm going to get your water. Mm. Let's move on, shall we? Okay. Ah, uh, Mythotopia, which I want to call Mythtopia. It just Mythotopia sounds weird, but eh, it's fine. Um, uh, uh, what's it? Martin Wallace is back, everybody. He's got two games at Essen this year, Mythotopia and Onward to Venus. He was originally supposed to have a third called Ships. And I have to admit, Ships was the one I was really excited about because that was kind of his um, returning to like a really heavy economic euro where you're building ships. You know, like in the past, he's done one, you know, like like brass or automobile or something like that. That one's not going to make the show, unfortunately, but the other two are. And Mythotopia, I'm super stoked about because Jen and I, in spite of the fact that we generally try and st- we don't like conflict heavy games, we thought a few acres of snow, Martin Wallace says a few acres of snow was brilliant, was an, a gorgeous, wonderful, wonderful game. And, um, you know, which crossed. Uh, you know, tactical miniature warfare with deck building. It was so innovative and it's just so rock solid. And I know the Halifax Hammer, for some people, broke it. We didn't care. We thought it was a brilliant game. Our only problem with the game was it modeled human beings killing other human beings with guns. You know, because it was a French-English war over, you know, North America. And so the theme basically ultimately killed it for us. We, we were able to put aside our disdain for warfare and really enjoyed it. But the theme... But here it comes again. He has basically, this is effectively a sequel to A Few Acres of Snow that is now set in a medieval fantasy universe where Jen will not have a problem with the warfare theme at all. She's totally cool with it. As long as it's not guns. So yay, we get that gameplay. Plus, now it's not only two player, it's two, three, or four player. So that's very cool. Not that we care. But we are so excited that we can get that game back now and play it with a theme that Jen is comfortable with. And then moving on, Onward to Venus. You know what? This one's in part only on the list because of Mythotopia. I mean, I feel like I should go on ahead and pick up both. I am a bit worried about this. I love the idea. It's a kind of a pulp 
noir type, um, you know, Buck Rogers science fiction kind of thing, where um, you know there's a, a, a system of planets. They're all laid out, all these planets on the board, and different um, chits I think get played randomly to all these planets. So different opportunities appear on the different planets randomly, and then the planets constantly new stuff is happening all the time. And so players have a hand of cards that they're using to rocket all around this solar system to try to be in the right place at the right time to you know get better technology to um, you know, save people in distress. And uh, basically, as it says, each turn you whiz around the planets and moons, claiming tiles. They let you draw cards. And now that's the problem. And attack other players, um, which is the thing I'm worried about. I love everything about this game. I love the Martian invasions, the robot rebellions, the space pirates, all that cool stuff. But also, it seems like a big part of this game is players trying to steal planets from each other. Now, uh, but here's the thing. I, I, I'm... Fingers crossed, hoping this will work for us, because I looked at the rules and there was a list of all the cards that come with it, and it seemed like it was only a small percentage of the of the cards and shits. It seems like we could almost just pull all those out of the game and then play a race version of this where we're not trying to kill each other. Now, who knows? Maybe that'll destroy the balance, but I love the theme of this so much and really, really do want to enjoy. Plus, you know, Martin Wallace, he's a great designer. I feel like I should check out everything he does, because he always does. Even if we don't like the game, he always does something interesting. So that's Onward to Venus. And hey, wow, we finished the second page. And I only broke down in tears once. Wasn't that nice? Uh, <laughs> sorry for my, uh, for my uh, waterworks there. But anyway... We're almost done, folks. Go into the final one, and the next one should be less because I think um, we don't have a full 25 items to go through. There's the links for it on the screen. Somewhere I'm pointing towards it. You can hit the button or follow the show notes in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. See you on the other side.